This episode is sponsored by your fading memories of Team Fortress 2. Celebration of local graffiti artists? I'll give you a headline, Local Man Cancels Newspaper Subscription. It isn't often that a show can manage to be both down-to-earth and simultaneously absurd. Those concepts, by their very definition, feel like they should be total opposites. But something King of the Hill mastered quite early on is the ability to take trivial or mundane topics and create an elevated feeling of importance around them. I mean, come on, tell me this isn't one of the most humdrum but acutely quirky things ever. Hmm, two and an eighth. And two and a sixteenth. Better let some air out of my left tires. The writers accomplished this balance between absurdity and sobriety by creating likable characters who, through their very nature of being likable, then makes the audience invested in what makes them happy. And the usual formula goes something like this. There's a norm established, that norm then gets interrupted or challenged, attempts are made to restore balance, usually by going too far in one direction or the other, and then we finally come to a new equilibrium, although one that is not quite the same as where we first started off. And that's admittedly a pretty standard plot archetype, but King of the Hill managed to make this feel fresh due to how typical, one might even say boring, the beginning stages of the plot are, which is then contrasted against something weird, odd, or utterly strange, some outside force that just takes us in a whole new direction. And there is no one in the entire show that embodies that feeling of otherness, that detachment from what we would consider a normal reality, than Mr. Dale Gribble himself. Up until this point in the show, Dale has been more of a background force, a true bohemian who has more than a smidge of Hunter S. Thompson thrown into the mix, but not in an over-the-top, larger-than-life parody like a certain best girl I could mention. Drop on, kid. Your training starts now. I'm through with you. You'll be a member of the elite agency that's been thankfully defending this big-ass country since the Second American Revolution. The Invisible One. Dale is much more of a quiet and scheming fellow in these early days. The kind of guy who's always making moves, even when you think he's not. Actually, especially when you think he's not. Eventually, the show would make him more of a bumbling and cowardly buffoon, which always seemed a little odd to me considering we already have Bill to fill in that role, but for the first half of the show, Dale tends to have much more grit and cunning to him. He's the kind of guy that is extremely enjoyable to watch just go crazy, but he would be a nightmare to live next to in real life. After all, let's not forget, he's a petty, backstabbing, antisocial, condescending, manipulative, emotionally abusive, turtle-polishing cuckold. Those are just quirks! And I really wouldn't have him any other way. Dale is just such an agent of chaos, a true antagonist, someone who brings about change and disruption wherever he goes. And to demonstrate just how wild this guy can get, the show decided to use him to strike at one of Hank's most precious pet projects, perhaps even his greatest non-work-related interest, his lawn. So let's see what happens when Dale decides to play hardball. The episode opens with Bill praising Hank's lawn, reminding them that a Cinco de Mayo block party is coming up, and Hank will want to get his lawn looking fire for it. Bill, my lawn is in a constant state of readiness. And this is where we get the entrance of the false antagonist of the episode, our wonderful Mr. Supanusenpon, who walks his dog on Hank's lawn, both establishing his dominance as the literal big dog of the neighborhood, and giving us a motivating factor to get things moving. He's got the best lawn in Arlen. Oh, best lawn! After mine! Ha! Ah! Now what's absolutely key to note here is that Dale comes into this encounter with Khan and gives Hank some backup, which makes it very clear that he's both in Hank's corner and is fully conscious of how much Hank's lawn means to him. Remember that, because it's going to be very important. So here's really where I should be talking about how great the animators did in making these lawns look lush and verdant. Something about the color of those greens they picked just really stand out, even to my colorblind eyes. I want to talk about that, I want to give it praise, but I just can't. And why? Because I don't have time to talk about it, because listen to how Peggy pronounces avocado and guacamole. It does not matter if your avocados are hard. Life is hard. You cannot make authentic guacamole out of lima beans and Ritz crackers. 
And you know, it's funny. It's so funny that it's almost sad because Peggy isn't trying to say palta, the Spanish word for avocado. She's literally just trying to say the English word avocado, but is fucking it up. <laughs> It's like she has a mental block for anything that has even a basic association with Mexico or Mexican culture. She may be weak in Spanish, sure, but there is so much more to it than just that. And it's just, it's made so much funnier when you remember that Mike Judge was born in Ecuador and speaks fluent Spanish. So all of this stuff that Peggy is doing and messing up, just know that it is just so deliberate by that animal Mike Judge. Whenever all of this Spanish stuff is happening and Peggy's just going crazy and doing just everything wrong, know that it is Mike Judge himself that is pushing your buttons. Ooh. Have at least one margarita before Bill finishes them all. It's not margarita, okay? It's margarita. But you know, real talk, I think I know what Peggy would say if somebody, particularly if it were me or Mr. Judge, tried to correct her on her pronunciation. All these people. Gringos. And speaking of corrections, and I know I'm getting a little tripped up here in the review, there's just so much to go over, but Hank, 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 I do believe that what you're about to say is the most factually incorrect statement you've made thus far in the entirety of all of these reviews. I should have the best lawn for Cinco de Mayo. But look at her, something's wrong. She's like a pretty girl with short hair. All right, all right, <laughs> okay. So first it was the Fran Drescher slander in the last review, and now this? You're going after girls with short hair? <laughs> I'm about ready to go to war with this man, I swear to God. I'm starting to think you deserve the shitstorm that's about to plague your household. And here's where Dale comes in, the true avatar of death, right on cue. He's here to spray Hank's lawn, as he usually does, ensuring a pest-free environment for only $2 a week. And there ain't much that you can get for $2 these days. A Costco hot dog and a drink combo, seven quarters, a firm handshake from yours truly, and the Brooklyn Bridge is about all you're gonna get. But Hank, being goaded on by Peggy, starts to think that perhaps Dale is being incompetent with his poison application, and that may be the cause of why his lawn does not look as good as Khan's. What's interesting is that we're never explicitly told if this suspicion is correct or not, which adds an extra little wrinkle into the mix. If this were a cut and dry decision, then it would be easy to side with Hank here. It wouldn't even be up for debate. But the possibility that Hank is firing his friend for no reason does add a bit of doubt that makes us pretty sympathetic to poor Dale. And not willing to go down without a fight, Dale goes into this semi-courtroom-esque rant about his passion for pest control. He does not want to get snubbed here. He is really trying to prove to his friends that he is competent at his job and he knows what he's doing, or at least that he knows more than Hank. I have read a book. And now, speaking purely as someone who's been through a lot of crazy relationships and breakups, I can tell you that this ending of Hank's professional career with Dale has all of the telltale signs of a disastrous breakup. I'm your exterminator. You were my exterminator. Now we're just friends. And how do I know it's a really bad breakup? Well, Hank goes on to do one of the worst things that you can do after a breakup, and that is to go and find someone shiny and new to fill that void. Why are men so attracted to hoes? Now free from Dale's poisonous influence, Hank decides to really put a lot of cash down here, convincing Peggy that it is critical that he buy <gasps> Raleigh St. Augustine grass. Adjusting for inflation, that bunch of sod costs about $2.40 these days, per square foot I might add, and since Hank told John Redcorn that he lives on an eighth of an acre, let's call it a sixteenth of an acre just for his lawn, that is 6,969 square feet, which means that Hank is about to spend the equivalent of $16,000 on his lawn before the sales tax. And even if you want to say that my calculation is off, let's say I fucked it up. English majors tend to do that with numbers. And let's say it's only half of my half-assed estimate. Then let's half it again, just because, you know, I'm being a little generous here right now. And let's say that Hank's only going to do the front of his lawn. That is still about $4,000 just on his lawn alone. And that's the lowest I can take it. That's the lowest estimate that I can give you guys. And what is Hank's reaction to this exuberant and ridiculous cost? So what? It's worth it. Without my lawn, I am Bill. Oh god, that is way too many thinkies. Luann, can you please help me get rid of my headache and show me the right way to enjoy a $4,000 purchase? <laughs> 
good against my skin. <laughs> Amen, sister. Amen. But while Luann is busy enjoying her newfound, uh, <laughs> garden of delight, Dale takes the opportunity to Trojan horse in some rather pesky bugs onto Hank's lawn. That's right, Dale has unleashed a bunch of fiery bulb lorbs on Hank's lawn. I mean, fire ants. Oh god, how careless of me to slip like that. I can't imagine what must be on my mind right now. <laughs> So yes, Dale ass dumps a bunch of bugs onto Hank's lawn on the very first day of its existence. The man literally just finished putting down the last piece of sod not five minutes ago, and Dale has already gone full animal warfare on it. I guess we should be glad he didn't send out frickin' elephants to do the dirty work. You know he would do it if he could. At least Hank gets to bask in the seething jealousy emanating off of Khan, if only for a moment. Yes, yes, all right, you win. Best lawn. Tomorrow, maybe we compare salary. And this victory is indeed quite short-lived, as Hank immediately steps on a fire ant, falls to his knees, and crawls over to the anthill, gasping in horror. And thus begins Hank's war with the ants. Now, fellas, gals, and all of those beyond, imagine making a lavish purchase for yourself, be it a new part for your car or computer, a nice bunch of clothes, or something that periodically enters and re-enters your body. I don't know. I don't judge. All I'm trying to say is imagine that purchase, and now, suddenly, oh no, it's covered in ants! I can say confidently that I think most of us, nay, nay, all of us would take the nuclear option here and purchase flies to eat out the brains of those little fiery bastards, which is exactly the route that Hank takes. And it would have worked if not for the interference of that dang Gribble Boy. So we've been talking a bunch about Dale and Hank, and we'll certainly get back to them, but for now, I think it's time we address the fat white lump in the room. Dear old Bobby Boy has decided to save some of the ants, taking them into his room and somehow even getting his hands on a dang queen. Dale must really have been throwing those things around like wedding rice or something, my goodness. So I'm gonna need you guys to help me out a bit here because there's a few points in this B-plot that really just make it very confusing and kind of mysterious. First of all, I really want you to listen to what Bobby says to Joseph when Joseph mentions that big old fake ant queen that's on top of Dale's van. It looks just like the one on my dad's truck. You mean Dale Gribble's truck? Yeah, yeah, my dad. So like, like, real talk here. Does Bobby know about the John Redcorn thing? I don't know. The writers are usually very, very careful to keep the kids away from that whole storyline. But this bit of dialogue from Bobby is so layered and so tricky that it really throws a lot of doubt onto everything. As a matter of fact, while we're sort of like following this train of thought, while we're chasing the rabbit down the hole, does... does Connie know about the John Redcorn thing? I mean, even if she doesn't figure it out herself, surely she would have heard Min and Con talking about it. Those two gush over drama like nobody's business. But Connie's also a pretty darn smart person. She's aware of the seedier and darker side of the adult world. I mean, for God's sakes, she was able to figure out that Bobby was cooking methamphetamine from just looking at a few simple tubes and ingredients. She knows what's going on with the world, so you know what? Actually, I'm going to say that if Bobby doesn't know, Connie definitely does, and maybe, maybe she even told him. But if you were going to pin me down and say, hey, what do you think about this whole situation? I would say that Bobby and Connie definitely do know, but they have accepted all of this nastiness with the ease of children. They just know that this is a part of their lives. It's something that's just, you know, there. They're not supposed to mention anything to Joseph or Dale. It's just one of those things you don't talk about and that kids just sort of live with. And yeah, yeah, all the John Redcorn stuff is scandalous and whatever, but what I really want to know about this episode is, do you think Bobby is just playing with these ants, or is he genuinely being mind-controlled here? Joseph mentions that the queen uses pheromones on the ants to make them her puppets, and that seems to be what's affecting Bobby, but I have seen some people claim that Bobby is only doing a little bit of weird play acting here, just doing what little kids do and letting his imagination run wild. But the thing is, the thing that keeps tripping me up with that whole theory is that Bobby only tends to do stuff like this if other people are watching. That's his whole thing. He wants to be a comedian. He wants to make other people laugh. But in this case, no one else is around to see him acting like this. And hell, he even scampers away from Peggy once he's gotten his queen sugar, like he's straight out of the frickin' Descent or something. I coat the churros with azucar or sugar. Well, very odd. Now what the heck was that? 
Something about the way Bobby moves in this episode is just so chilling. I bet Mike Judge would be an amazing horror director. Give me Mike Judge's take on something like Barbarian or Malignant. Hell, I'd even let him direct like a Michael Myers Halloween reimagining. That would be something to see. But anyway, this is all to say that all of these creepy things that Bobby's doing seem pretty out of character for him. He changes the radio from hard rock to smooth sounds for the Queen's enjoyment. He talks to the Queen as if it's a person itself. And, well, uh, he does this. These are queen. These are. So, uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> I don't think imagination is providing that. No way. I think given what the show is giving us and what we know about Bobby, all comes together to seriously suggest that he was under the influence of none other than the marijuana poisoning. Uh, I mean the ant queen pheromones. Does it make sense that he's getting mind controlled this way? God no. But again, it is amazingly, wonderfully absurd. I mean, hey, maybe Dale did something to those bugs. Who can say what he's been doing with them down there in that horrible basement? And hey, isn't this a smart segue back into the Dale stuff? God, I'm good. So because of Dale's interference, Hank's flytrap didn't work, and thus he decides to take a more direct approach, piloting his American mech and bringing hot, bladed fury down upon these ants. But that does little to stem the unceasing tide of Dale's fury. You got a permit for all that construction? You've got ants. This terrible lawn situation ruins Hank's reputation with the guys, reducing him to the status of a Dale-like figure. Propane is what I know best. Well, it sure ain't lawns. <laughs> 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 yeah, my <laughs> He even has to go begging to his friend to please eliminate these ants, and he does it with a surprisingly frank and open apology. Because I'm coming to you man to man, offering a genuine apology for choosing my lawn over our friendship. With seemingly things back in order and bridges being mended, Hank dons his best Bane mask and watches as Dale unleashes a war crime unto his pride and joy. This kills everything in sight, reducing Hank's lawn to a throne of ashes. Look upon him, viewers, for here rests Ozymandias, king of kings. Behold his kingdom and tremble! While Hank is sinking into the ground, Peggy goes into the Gribble basement and discovers a disquieting diorama. And so our little Clarice has found her Buffalo Bill, although this one offers to make an entirely different kind of suit. What? on God's green earth are you doing with all these fire ants? Uh, they're silkworms. Uh-huh. If you keep your mouth shut, I'll make you a business suit. For some reason, Dale allows Peggy to leave his chambers alive, the fool, and this results in her telling Hank about the whole scheme. Without anything left to lose, Hank tries to kick Dale's ass, but before he can fulfill this booty butchery, a certain someone comes back into the picture. That's right, poor Bobby has gotten himself swarmed with the ants that he serves so loyally. It's an extremely unsettling sight, and I'm not really sure why, but it reminds me of that one zombie that was chained up in 28 Days Later, the one that the army guys were keeping locked up behind all of those bedsheets. There's no real through line to connect them, no overarching themes or imagery, and I guess it's just that my brain is sending up these big ass like danger danger signs in both cases, because there's just something so visceral, so just unsettling about both of them. Seeing that Bobby is about to suffer some extreme pain, Dale immediately disregards his malice and fear of Hank, calmly telling Bobby to take his hand and allow the ants to swarm over him. Say what you will about Dale, and I mean, I did, I badmouthed the crap out of him at the beginning of this video, but this is one of the most noble things he's ever done. Just look at how he suffers here, how he writhes in pain. He may play it cool, but this is some serious stuff here. This act both redeems him in the eyes of Hank, making them even for the lawn assassination, and allows the viewing audience to know that Dale isn't some irredeemable jerk that's only out for himself. Dale survives and everything is forgiven, finally getting us to the Cinco de Mayo party. And at this party, we see Peggy in perhaps her most beautiful look ever. Seriously, I don't know if it's the dress or the rose in the hair, but the whole thing just comes together beautifully. She really is one handsome woman. And in the end, all of Hank's friends and neighbors, and uh, John Redcorn for some reason, come together to give him bits of lawn, which also gives us perhaps the most wonderfully awkward and gentle ending thus far, presenting us with this delightful chestnut. You're my best friend, Dale. Well, I thought I was your best friend, Hank. <laughs> yeah, well, 
<sighs> Don't you just love when friends can be brutally honest with you? Rip my heart out, you mountains of malice. Destroy my self-esteem, you satyrs of slay. Don't forget to tuck me in, though, because I need to know that the monster in my room is actually my best friend. God, can you tell that I'm writing and recording all this shit at 2 in the morning? Because I'm starting to. And so with all the fire ants fled or dead, and with Hank's friendship with Dale reestablished, I think that we can all say that this was a very wholesome bit of eco-terrorism, one that made us all stronger for having lived through it. And gosh golly, what else is there to say about Dale's big introduction? It hit on all the biggest and juiciest parts of Dale's character, from his extermination business to his dedication on expressing his passions, both malicious and benign, and set him firmly into the Mount Rushmore of this show. Now, Hank, Dale, and even Boomhauer are all pretty well set up, but surprisingly, Bill has gotten so little in this first season that I'm actually left with quite an unsettled feeling. I just need that one last click to happen, and then we'll really have a show worth talking about. In the meantime, I'm glad to see little bits of character being deepened throughout. This was a great episode for Hank, and an even better one for Khan, because it established that he's a face that we'll be seeing around and checking in with throughout the seasons, making the whole neighborhood feel so much more alive and fluid. So yes, Dale's great, those ants were great, and everything worked out in the end. A real classic through and through. Although, if you want to talk about classics, if you want to talk about an all-time iconic moment from this little show we call King of the Hill, then you better put on a helmet because we're about to run straight into one of the most striking and gut-bustingly awesome scenes of the entire series. If you know, then you know. It's coming. It's right around the corner. That's right. It's in the season finale. We're here. We're finally here. We are home and I can't wait to settle in. For now though, we can say that this episode, titled King of the Ant Hill, has indeed been reviewed to death. Thanks for watching, and remember, if you're gonna break up with someone, make sure they're not a queen ant. Hey, look at that chubby white one. He reminds me of me, before my growth spurt.